Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, I would like to start a new topic. Um, this is cylinders, um, a continuation of, uh, of the part of this course which is dedicated to solid geometry. So we'll talk about the cylinders and primarily about two characteristics uh, of the cylinder, area and the volume. Um, well, I do suggest you to uh, watch this lecture from the unisor.com website because it contains not only the reference to the video itself, but also notes, which can serve as a textbook. And then there is a whole functionality which is built into this website. Um, it involves uh, enrolling uh, students into particular courses, uh, into um, and then exams, uh, etc. All right, so cylinders. Well, with a little stretch of imagination, you can view this as a cylinder. Sorry about drawings. Let me just remind you a little bit. Um, cylinder um, basically is defined um, as um, a geometrical object which is uh, bounded by its side surface which is a cylindrical surface, and I'll talk about what cylindrical surface actually is. And two planes, top and bottom. Um, also, what's important about this cylindrical surface, which is a side surface of this, uh, uh, of the, of this object. Now, cylind <coughs> cylindrical surface is formed by, if you remember, a straight line called generatrix, which is moving parallel parallel to itself along some kind of a curve called directress in the 3D space. In this case, directress is a circle. A circle on some kind of a plane. So if the directress is a circle, then generatrix generates this round uh, cylindrical uh, surface and this generatrix is supposed to be perpendicular to the plane where directress, the circular base of the cylinder, is located. Now, a as far as these two uh, planes, top and bottom, they also should be parallel to the plane where directress is located. Or you can think that the, uh, uh, that the bottom, let's say, base is a directress, or the top base, which is a circle, um, uh, is a directress. So that's how the whole um, uh, cylinder is built. It's a cylindrical surface with a straight line as a generatrix with a circular directrix and the generatrix is supposed to be perpendicular to the plane where um, directrix is located. So, <coughs> so that's how the cylinder is built. Now, what are um, parameters which characterize this circle? Well, actually there are two parameters um, and they completely uh, define uh, the cylinder. These parameters are the radius of a circle and its height or altitude. So this is the distance between two base, uh, two bases between the top and the uh, and the bottom base. Distance between two parallel planes, if you wish. Um, and uh, the r is radius of the base. Both of them obviously are the same. Well, there are a few uh, uh, statements which I just made, which probably require, in a very rigorous sense, some some proof. For instance, uh, how can I prove that if I have a cylindrical surface with a circular uh, directrix, how can I prove that these two planes will intersect uh, according to the uh, uh, circles which are exactly the same as, as a directrix? These are kind of a trivial theorems and I'll probably do it in some, some other lecture just as an exercise or give it an exam, for instance. That would be fine. <coughs> so today I would like to talk about the area of the surface and the volume of the cylinder. 
based on these two parameters, which presumably completely identify uh, the, uh, the cylinder. All right, let's talk about the surface first. first. Now, um, the surface of this object contains the side surface, which is this rounded cylindrical surface, and two bases. Well, two bases are simple. There are two circles, so the uh, area of the base is pi r squared, the area of two bases is 2 pi r squared. Okay, now how about this uh, cylindrical surface? Um, what's its uh, uh, area? Now, I would like to approach this from intuitive level um, rather than from the level of rigorous proof. Intuitively, it is obvious that if you cut our cylinder along uh, one of the generatrix and just open it up, it will be a rectangle. Now, the height of this rectangle will be exactly h, obviously. Now, what would be um, the length of this horizontal segment? Well, let's just think about it. If you cut this and open it up, obviously the length of this circumference would be exactly this, right? So it would be 2 pi r. Now, this is kind of an intuitive understanding of this, and I think I would be quite satisfied with this. Obviously there is some more rigorous proof, and I will talk about rigorousness a little bit further when I will talk about the volume. Um, it probably would require some using usage of the limit theory. But for now, I think this intuitive understanding of what is the area of the side cylindrical surface, <coughs> I think it's quite sufficient actually to basically state that intuitively it's obvious that this particular circumference will open up in this um, uh, segment and uh, the height would be equal to, to, to this. And again, since we have um, said from the very beginning that the generatrix is perpendicular to the plane where, um, where the directrix is located, right? So that's why this is rectangle. That's why this angle is um, right, 90 degrees. Which means that the area of this particular uh, side surface of a cylinder is equal to 2 pi r h. 2 pi r times h. And if you add them together, you have a full surface of a cylinder which you can uh, factor out 2 pi r, r plus h if you wish. I don't want you to remember this formula. What I do want you to remember is that you can actually cut the cylinder and convert it into a, the side a cylindrical surface and convert it into a rectangle. And then add just two um, uh, areas, uh, top and bottom base, and that would be it. So I don't remember this formula, but as you see, I can derive it in like a minute. So that's basically something which is related to the area. Now let's talk about the volume. Well, volume is slightly more complex thing in this particular case, and I don't think I can avoid using the limit theory in this case. And the way how I'm going to do it is the following. Let's inscribe into the circle, uh, which is a base, uh, a regular uh, polygon with n sides. Something like this. In this case, I have inscribed a uh, hexagon. And do exactly the same on the top. By just doing this.
something like this. So, what I have done is, now this is invisible, and this is invisible. Something like this. So, what I did was inscribed the uh, polygon with n, uh, regular polygon with, with n vertices, and then just have perpendiculars within the cylindrical surface uh, to this uh, base um, up until it goes to the top base. And obviously, on the top base, I will have exactly the same uh, similar, actually, uh, congruent. Uh, n-sided polygon. So now, what, what happens right now with my uh, cylinder? Now I have a, a prism inscribed into a cylinder, right? Now let's think about it. What is the volume of this prism? Well, the volume of the prism, we know what it is. It's the area of the base times height. Okay. Now let's increase the number of uh, sides of the polygon which I have inscribed. Let's say instead of this, I will have this. Instead of this, I will have this. So more and more vertices would be part of this. So it's more tightly <coughs> inscribed into, um, into, a, uh, into a circle. And correspondingly, my prism will be tighter and tighter inscribed into a cylinder. And here, again, intuitively obvious that as number of uh, vertices in this regular polygon at the end goes to infinity, my polygon will, clo will be closer and closer to the circle, and my prism inscribed into a cylinder would be closer and closer to the cylinder itself. So the volume of the prism probably will be uh, will, will tend to the volume of the cylinder. Now, what does it mean? The area of the polygon would be closer and closer to the area of the circle, which is pi r squared. The height of the prism is always the same. It's the same height as the height of the uh, cylinder. So the volume of the um, prism will be closer and closer to this, which I can actually say that this is probably the volume of the cylinder. So this is the area and this is the volume. Now, I actually referred to your intuition a couple of times here. This is not rigorous as the true mathematician would probably present it. However, well, number one, I think for educational purposes, this is even better. However, I would like you to still have a feel of how the rigorous approach would probably proceed in this particular case. Well, let's just um, take, for instance, um, the uh, this particular volume. Now, to be precise, what I would like, what I think I would like to do is the following. I have this inscribed prism into a cylinder. I can also have circumscribed prism. So I will circumscribe a polygon around this uh, circle. So it's bigger than a circle. And build a prism out of this bigger 
uh, uh, polygon. Now, if the first prism was inside the cylinder, the second prism would be outside of the cylinder. So one prism would be inscribed, another circumscribed. And then, what I would do, I would take the limit of both, my inscribed prism and circumscribed prism, as number of uh, sides goes to infinity. And the limit probably would be the same. I mean, I have to prove it, obviously. But it's kind of obvious that the tighter you have around, the, the tighter prism you have around the cylinder, it will still probably be, as a limit, it will go to a certain number. And if you have an inscribed prism, it will go probably to also the number. And if these limits are the same, remember there was a theorem. If you have three different variables, and these two are going into the same, uh, this is variables which are indexed by n. And as n in is increasing, these two have the same limit. It means this is also the same limit. Now, in our case, this would be the, uh, the value of the cylinder. This is the value of the uh, inscribed prism. And this would be the value of circumscribed prism. And if their volumes are going into the same limit, it means that my volume of the cylinder is exactly this limit. So this is how it can be done with the volume. And by the way, very similarly, we can do the same with um, the area of the uh, side surface. How? Again, let's inscribe the uh, rectangle not rectangle, a uh, polygon, some n-sided polygon inside the base of the cylinder. And um, do basically this uh, prism construction. Now, the side area of the cylinder would be around this prism. Now, what is the, uh, sides, uh, the area of the side surface of the prism? Well, that's some of these rectangles, right? Each side uh, of this uh, right prism is a rectangle. So, if I will summarize the, um, the areas of these uh, rectangles, it would be what? The side of the polygon times h, another side times h, etc. So, I will have to add all these sides together and multiply it by h to get the uh, uh, to get the area, right? So let me just write it down. So if my n-sided polygon has the length of the side A, then I will have to have n times A times H, right? A times H would be the area of one particular uh, face of this prism, and n is number of these prisms, which is exactly the same as this. And what is n times a? n times a is a perimeter of this uh, n-sided polygon inscribed into a circle. And as n goes to infinity, obviously this perimeter will go to the circumference of the, uh, of the circle. So that will go to 2 pi r. Again, it needs to be proven in exactly the same fashion. I can do an inscribed polygon and outside po uh, 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 and, and circumscribed polygon outside of a circle and check their perimeters and make sure that their perimeters as n goes to infinity goes to the same limit and that limit would be therefore the length of the circle. So this is just the road how uh, we can proceed with um, uh, more rigorous proof of whatever I was just saying. But again, I would quite frankly prefer you to, uh, to go by your intuition. And intuition shows basically that the area, that the cylinder, it, it looks like a prism with infinite number of small, uh, uh, small faces on the side, if you wish. And uh, therefore, every formula which is uh, related to the prism, like for instance, 
the, the volume of the prism is uh, area of the base times height is actually applicable to a cylinder as well. So again, view a cylinder as, as a prism with uh, infinite number of infinite small side faces. That would be probably a proper description of that. So that's probably it for today. I would like you to read the notes for this lecture. They are presented on unisor.com. Um, and uh, uh, try to just in your head try to really go through all these logical assumptions with limits etc which will allow you to to build your intuition in this particular case so your intuition should really um, uh, lead you to a conclusion that there is no much difference between the prism and the cylinder and um, the, whatever the properties of the of the prism prism are more or less general for all the prisms those are probably are true for cylinders as well well that's it for today thank you very much and good luck <laughs>